Time to take another dip into the papers now. Here with us reviewing them are the journalist and broadcaster, Badisha Mamata, and the editor of Spiked magazine, Tom Slater. So welcome back to both of you. Um, now, Tom, we're starting with your choice, first of all, and this is the main story on the front of t today's uh, Daily Telegraph. Uh, void A&E, says the NHS. So uh, tell us a little bit more about what they're saying and why. Yes, so various NHS trusts and leaders have been instructed to put together a public relations campaign, essentially to warn people away from trying to access A&E if they do not actually have emergency care needs. Um, this is quite unprecedented insofar as how early it is in the year before minds suddenly turn to trying to manage demand on the health service. You, you know, it's still summer, it's still warm outside, and yet still we're seeing this pressure for this campaign being talked about as a help us, help you campaign. And it's got a lot of medics worried. Um, there's people quoted in this particular story, Carl he Hennigan, an urgent care doctor, as well as an academic, who says that he sees an alarming repeat of what happened during the pandemic, which is that you tell people not to access the NHS, you know, protect the NHS, we were told, rather than it protecting us. And as a result, you have people not ac accessing care when they actually need it. And, it. and it sort of makes sense when you think that, you know, most people who are probably hypochondriacs who, who are want to, you know, go to a and &E if they've got a particularly bad headache or whatever, it's not clear that they're going to be swayed by this kind of campaign. But the people who will be swayed are probably the people who do actually need to access this. Obviously, the NHS is under huge strain after the lockdowns, after the pressure on NHS services, delayed treatments and all the rest of it, you know, almost six million people on those waiting lists. But this, we really can't carry on in this situation in which we're almost asked to ration our own use of the health service in order to keep the show on the road. I, I understand the pressures at the moment, but long term, we need to find a way structurally to make sure people can get the care that they need, even in times where the health service is going to be under more pressure. Well, yeah, and, and Badisha, the, the, the pressures do look like they're going to be big. I know the NHS Confederation yesterday was worrying that because people may not be putting their heating on, for example, they may suffer more respiratory infections, for example, this winter. Uh, but but it's, a, it's a really difficult balance, isn't it? Um, you know, you, you want people to make sure they get treatment if, if they need it. But at the same time, you don't want people clogging up the, the, the waiting rooms in A&E with, with minor issues. It's, it's, it's a difficult message to send out. It's a really difficult message to send out and it also shows exactly as you imply that absolutely everything is related to everything else. So the cost of living crisis means that people are going to choose between heating and eating. That's going to lead to knock-on effects. Now we also know that during the pandemic, so many people who needed constant care uh, operations, treatments about unrelated, non-COVID related things were dissuaded from getting that care and that had knock-on effects as well but I think Tom's underlying point is really crucial which is this is a very telling call for help now the NHS has always been seen and rightly seen itself as heroic so things have come to a pretty pass where the system itself is even now admitting look we're going to need you to help us to reduce demand even though you may indeed need it I agree with this point this is not really about hypochondriacs at all this is about how do we reduce pressure on a system which is now showing the strain of decades upon decades of mismanagement underfunding underinvestment misinvestment all the cracks are starting to show and that's a really classic symptom if you will of the pandemic which is that all the fault lines in our social uh, organizations that were there already were being massively exacerbated because of this extra pressure and this crisis and Badisha, you talk about the impacts of the pandemic and we're still feeling the effects in so many areas of our life, aren't we? You've picked out a story uh, in The Telegraph about um, the impact it's having on people's exam results. Of course, we've seen a slight downgrading of A-levels. They're still up on pre-pandemic levels, but uh, to try to get things back in balance after the, the teacher assessment years. And uh, this article suggesting that there'll be lots of appeals because of that, is that right? Yeah, that's exactly it. There's been a bit of a strange gloss on this story as if uh, young people are so incredibly fragile, they're all suddenly doing terribly in their A-levels. That's not the case. In fact, what happened is uh, their projected grades were based on their GCSEs. The year that followed was in the pandemic, so there were no or there were reduced exams. And then it turned out that there had been a kind of grade escalation, which is now being deflated back down. So the proportion of A's and A-stars 
is lower than what was predicted by students' own teachers. And this is leading to a spike in uh, the article quotes, sharp-elbowed parents, pushy middle-class parents, I think that's code for, asking for their kids' grades to be reviewed. Now, usually there are appeals against grades every single year, but this time around, it's projected to hit 7,000, which is a hugely high amount. Not only that, but we know a very high proportion of students have lost out because of those grade escalations to begin with on not only their first choice university, but also their second choice university. So lots of students are going to be calling, clearing and hustling around for their preferred choice at a university they're okay with and let's not forget we haven't yet had the GCSE results in yeah. so we're going to see from the GCSE results the results of those pandemic years lots of work from home learning from home on an even younger cohort of students and for me at least it's it's that younger cohort that I worry about because the pandemic was really very very hard on but really tough for young, for young people generally, I think. And very briefly, uh, let's turn to The Guardian, uh, Tom. Uh, police will be told to tackle street crime, not tweets. Is the story here? Yes, so this is um, a story from the latest Conservative hosting, so Liz Truss and Anne Rishi Sunak talking about law and order and this particular issue of the police involving themselves in offensive tweets, online arguments. I know this has become a bit of an applause line in the Tory leadership race, but I think it is actually a very important story. It's nine people a day being arrested by police over offensive things they say on the internet. 120,000 people or more have been given those non-crime hate incidents. Not even okay. crimes, but recorded against their name with a complaint. Very serious issue and it's good okay. that it's being talked about. Tom, sorry to rush you there, but we're, we're out of time. Not we'll be back in the next hour, though, I'm pleased to say. Thank you both for the moment. Do stay with us. Top Story is coming up next. We'll have all the latest.